how to plan your tech product. How do you set the work? How do you understand how long it's going to take? And how do you allocate the different members of the team? I am going to be talking through a four-step approach that I learned to scoping out technical projects. I learned this while working a pretty little thing and I've used it on every project since, including being a CTO at a startup. The four steps go over objectives, minimum requirements, scoping the work and estimating the time. But to make it a little bit easier, you can use the four Ds. Define success, deduct the fact, divide the work, deduce time. Number one, define success. This is probably the most important step and interesting enough kind of overlooked depending on where you work, but OKRs and KPIs. An OKR is an objective key result, which basically means you specify exactly what you want to get. A KPI stands for key performance indicator, which basically means some sort of metric you can use to measure how things have progressed. So if you are working on a checkout system and you want more people to complete their orders your kpi could be abandoned cart metrics so like what percent of users were going to the checkout abandon their car now an okr basically uses a kpi to define a result so an okr would be a three percent decrease in abandoned checkouts the kpi a little bit tricky but think about it a little bit it'll make sense there are two types of things really that you can build that are features and improvements a feature is new code you know if you have a service an additional service on top of that and then an improvement is like a book fix design change all the above now the reason you want okrs is because it helps you frame why you're working on what you're working on let's say you're building a new feature and the primary OKR defined by the businesses, they want a 10% you know, customer adoption rate, which means 10% of the customers that get to this page use this additional service. You may think, oh, well, that's got nothing to do with the feature I build. A lot of that is the handover from the current user flow. Exactly, that's kind of the point. It's so you don't just think of what you're building individually, you holistically think of the system and the objective you're trying to get. Because you might realize, oh, this isn't super development heavy. The main thing we actually need to do is work on the UX of our current flow to make sure we push new users across. So interesting distinction, but very useful to actually define these things beforehand to understand where the work needs to go. Number two, deduct fact. What are the minimum requirements that you can make into your product or service that will satisfy the OKR? I normally do this by specifying everything that could possibly happen and then deducting from it. If it's a new feature, let's say on your checkout system, you want to add promo codes. Okay, well, how can a user do it? You know, they can, they can add a promo code on the checkout, great. Can they combine promo codes? Can a promo code be, you know, just the price? Is it postage? Is it for certain regions? Do you want these kind of limitations on it? The useful thing about listing them out is you now have a benchmark. You can see everything and it lets you take things out and it's a little bit easier to organize. So don't think too much, just get everything down and then chop away as you see fit. Just from personal experience, you're gonna cut out more anyway. Either during development, you're gonna have to move stuff out or just through the next phases that I talk about, but it's good to do the initial trim. Step three, scoping. Now that you know exactly what you need to build, you need to figure out how this actually works in terms of manageable pieces. Modularity is the biggest thing here. You want things divisible and composable. This means things can be created in isolation, but then added together at any random time. Reason being, you might have a system whereby multiple teams are collaborating on a feature and if three different teams need to do three different parts of this feature the three teams might have different timelines and then you know if one team finishes in half the time the other teams are waiting around you can't test your work until the other teams are ready it, it gets really messy not relying on other pieces of work is the main thing you want i know sometimes it's unavoidable but really do fight for this with the technical team in system design there's always going to be restrictions you know specifying how part a works fundamentally dictates how part b can work so when you start, you're probably better off putting restrictions around the thing you think is going to change the least or the most complicated part. So normally when I actually build a product from scratch, I actually start with the UX and I set that as a constraint for how the data will be interacted with on the back end, which is very unpopular. But point being, the thing that I find the most valuable is the thing I start with because it restricts and anchors everything else. But when working in larger teams, normally the most complex part is how the work fits together, which is normally why that's the best thing to anchor. So specifying how part A is going to work with part B and C is actually the easier thing. And once that's decided, the teams can build all their work around that because you've got that central piece. So this means instead of thinking about, oh, what can feature A do? It's more, where does feature A fit? 
and how can every other feature interact with it is there an api schema that goes with it like what is it that happens it's setting up the relations between the work the most important thing is going to be the inputs and the outputs so the other teams can interact with it and so you can test it in isolation that way multiple pieces of work can be done can be tested and potentially even released without relying on other teams which is going to cause issues you can keep doing this as well because the feature itself probably has multiple divisible elements inside itself that you can do that with which means multiple team members can be working on a feature at once. They can test it separately and they don't block each other. And then rule four, estimate time. A law that judges this for me is Murphy's law, which is if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. As a rule of thumb, I actually double whatever the time estimates are for whatever I have. So if I scoped out work that I think is gonna take a month, estimate two. Now, when you 2X the time estimates, you're gonna realize, oh my God, there is no way I can do this in the deadline. 80% uh, of the time, this is the case. Sorry, not sorry, this is life. Uh, we get crazy deadlines and we have crazy expectations and it's our job to figure out how we can do this. Now, you need to further trim the fat and it's gonna be very ugly. If you can figure out a way that you can potentially satisfy the OKRs within the new time frame, which is basically half, it's not gonna be pretty, but you will come out with a gen. What you will get at the end is very slim, but something very achievable and something very safe. The benefit of this is you laser focus because you absolutely cannot have anything that you don't think is gonna affect the KPI. There is another law, Parkinson's law, which is that work will expand to fit the time it's allotted. And I don't necessarily, I'm not using this rule in terms of the work, but I believe the same with requirements. I think the longer time you have, you will fluff out requirements, you will make the project need to do more, you will try and add more. So by decreasing the time, again, it forces you to try and get rid of this bias of like, oh, the Fiji could do this and that. I wish I took this lesson to heart earlier in my career. I think the place it really hit home for me was the start where it was just kind of like, um, you know, constant deadline and it was a lot of high pressure work. You kind of end up cutting off a lot of the work to try and just satisfy the KPI or OKR anyway. And it's like, had you have done it earlier, you would have planned for it. The work would have been cleaner. There would have been less tech debt and it would have been better for everyone's morale. And I, I wish I took that approach. I have heard people tell me that's kind of defeatist, you know, not trying to hit the, the goal and all, you know, and trying to slim everything down. I, I really don't care. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pick the safe option every time. You know, if I know I can build a modular brick of the system and bit by bit add a brick and it stays safe, I'm going to do the overtaking these gambles because developing a feature halfway is actually worse than not doing it at all because if it's in production and it's only half developed it's a ticking time bomb if it doesn't make it to production guess what you've wasted the time to do it because the timeline doesn't stop you know it, it's not like you'll get to the end of it and then all upper management will say oh okay well you know here's double the deadline because it wouldn't have been a deadline if they could do that in the first place right there's going to be more work that comes in and you just it's gonna get lost in the backlog. So you're actually better off building things you know you can build and doing them properly. Rushing to build something, not finishing it, and because you've rushed, not having proper code quality, it is a recipe for tech, tech debt and backlog, which I sadly fall victim to. Good enough is the gold standard. Do not strive for perfection. As my father always used to tell me, a bird in the hand is worth two in the nest. And guess what? You know, if you've already got a bird in your hand, you can always reach for a second. If you get more time, go for it.